Hello, everybody. I'm Dirk Ashton, and this is the Evolving Landscape of Urban Fantasy panel, populated with an all-star cast of panelists. Um, let's introduce ourselves, starting with Chloe. Hi, everybody. I'm Chloe Neal. I am the author of, I think, 26 books. 27 wow. will be out um, later this year. I know it's insanity. It's, there's no need for it. Um, most of my books are urban fantasy. I also write young adult. Um, most of my books are about vampires. Um, the most recent are Heirs of Chicagoland, which is the um, sequel to the Chicagoland Vampire series. Um, and I've also written um, books set in New Orleans, um, post-apocalyptic magic, young adult, um, and then also a uh, kind of Napoleonic alt history with magic. So that's where I am. Nice. TL? Hello, I am Tendai Huchu writing as TL, which I feel rather inadequate because I've only got four books at the moment. <laughs> I'm working my way towards 26. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm the author of a fantasy series called the Edinburgh Night Series. I live in Edinburgh, Scotland, um, and it's an urban fantasy series. We're into book two now, which is Our Lady of Mysterious Elements, and later on this year, the third book in the series uh, titled The Mystery of Dunvegan Castle is due to come out. So I double in the novel and the short form. Thank you. Nice. Claire? Ooh, hi, everyone. Um, I'm JD or Claire, depending on which, which name you like better. Uh, I just recently published my first novel, so book number two. Uh, so I have a lot of catching up to do. Um, the, the book is Monkey Around, written under JD Jang. And it's um, an urban fantasy taking place in San Francisco, featuring uh, mostly Asian um, supernatural creatures. Uh, the protagonist is a female monkey king. Um, who is running around San Francisco during the Occupy movement, um, trying to discover who is murdering shapeshifters. And um, they're mostly non-Western mythological creatures uh, because I love, love, love urban fantasy. And Chicagoland Vampires was so much fun. Um, oh, thank you. But I also thought that there was something really missing from urban fantasy, which was my, my own uh, community and uh, my own traditions. So... That's uh, that's what I wrote for you all. Nice. Do you prefer JD or Claire? I am totally open to either one. I, like seriously, pick whichever one you like has the best mouth feel. Okay, <laughs> that's fair. Uh, Your Majesty McHugh. <laughs> My Majesty. Uh, I've never been called that before. Uh, I'm uh, I'm Steve McHugh. I write mostly urban fantasy. I think I think I'm up to book twenty two now. So that's, I think I forget because I'm old. Um, <laughs> uh, I uh, uh, written Helicon Chronicles, Avalon Chronicles, Rebellion Chronicles. Um, most recently, the Riftborn books, the first book of which came out at the end of last year, um, The Last Raven, and the next book is uh, Blessed Odds, which comes out next month, and then uh, Talon's Wrath, which comes out in June. I've also written a science fiction book, historical fantasy, and I'm currently writing another urban fantasy book that I'm not allowed to talk about. So, That's yeah. a lot of books coming out in a very <clears> short <throat> yeah. time. Yeah, I um, well, there's two this year, and then maybe three this year. I don't know. Depends <laughs> if I publish, I publish the third one this year or not. There's so many, I can't keep track. I, I, it, <laughs> yes, I'm just going to say yes and just go. Yeah. <laughs> Alex. Hi, uh, I'm Alex Jennings. I, I work out in New Orleans. I uh, published my first novel last summer. It's called The Ballad of Perilous Graves. And Congrats. it's a sort of, uh, oh, thank you. It's a uh, black exploitation Pippi Longstocking story set in a version of New Orleans where music is a form of sorcery. And uh, it was great fun to write. A black exploitation Pippi Longstocking. I'm hooked. I mean, that's the only blurb I need. That sounds awesome. And set in New Orleans. Um, so, the evolving landscape of urban fantasy is the name of this panel. Um, I uh, I would imagine we all write it, and I would imagine we all have read a lot of it. 
um, to know what it's where it's evolving to, what it might evolving to, where it's come from. Let's start. What do you think with um, what to you is like the iconic or classical urban fantasy when you think of urban fantasy? What one book and author is the first thing that pops into your mind? I mean, you can cheat a little, two or three, but what is what is that one iconic fits what you could might consider a classic definition of, of urban fantasy? Chloe? Oh gosh, that is a tough one. Um I so from my perspective, and this is based on um, where I started reading uh, was probably Charlene Harris um, and the True Blood series, which is, I think, as much maybe vampire romance and rural fantasy as it is urban fantasy. Exactly. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> we didn't script that, but thank you for having that ready to go. Um, you know, that's a key factor. Um, and a lot of um, folks who came up and started writing urban fantasy, uh, particularly women uh, with urban fantasy or urban fantasy that started in kind of 2008, 2009. Some of that was influenced by Twilight. Some of that was influenced by kind of the Charlene Harris um, vampire trend. Um, I often say that a rising vampire tide floats all vampire boats. And I was very fortunate to kind of get in that flood in the beginning. Um, and, you know, I was very lucky that that was kind of when my first uh, release happened. Um, but for me, vampires are kind of the, the quintessential urban fantasy element. Okay. Um, Tende? I'm going to do a, a bit of a cheat, and I, and I love uh, Charlene Harris um, yeah. and that particular series. Um, but I grew up sort of like in Zimbabwe hearing all these weird stories about, I mean, if, if, if anyone knows anything about Zimbabwean culture, um, you you have these crazy stories even in the newspapers about goblins and money spitting snakes and all that crazy. And, and this is almost part of the culture that the supernatural coexists next to us. Um, even though, unfortunately, you know, I've only ever met people who know someone who's seen a ghost, but never seen one myself and stuff like that. But in, in, in terms of literature, um, the, the one book that sort of stands out to me is, is Gay Men's Neverwhere. Mm -hmm. um, I think that was sort of like the first time I was like, okay, this is an, an actual thing. But it's only much later on that I could blend it with some of these tales that I heard and say, okay, this is pretty much the same vibe, but diff done differently um, in this particular art form, uh, telling stories from sort of like a Western culture. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, JD, I'm going to go back and forth to see which one feels the best throughout the panel. <laughs> well, um, obviously, my mind went straight to Anne Rice. Um, and the, the first one I read was The Vampire List Stat, um, although Interview with the Vampire List is the, is the one that, that everybody thinks of. Um, and I haven't seen the show yet. But, um, but of course, then when you roll forward from there, for me, I go straight to Neil Gaiman. Um, for me, it was um, American Gods and Nancy Boys. Uh, and then um, and these are, are, of course, the, the, the order in which I read my first U.S. books. And then um, China Medieval's um, King Rat. Mm -hmm. Cool. Steve. Uh I don't know what my first urban fantasy was, if I'm honest with you. I, I, I grew up reading comic books and, and lots of comic books like Blade and things like that. So, mm -hmm. so that you know, um, Wealth at Night and and, uh, and all that sort of thing. So they probably had a, a an influence on me. Um, the first comic, the first books that I think of off the top of my head are Kelly Armstrong's Women of the Other World mm -hmm. um, and the Anita Blake books. By Laurel Hamilton, and and also um, Felix Castor's Felix Castor, Felix Castor book by Mark Carey. I think, yeah, <laughs> I think those three kind of the, what they were in my mind at the time, especially the quintessential urban fantasy, and then Neil Gaiman and and Rice, and and you know even you can go further and further back to you know Dracula and stuff like that if you want to thought think of that as urban fantasy for the horror. But but yeah, I think uh, comics were my was my starting position and then I went from that. Awesome. Alex. Well, a lot of mine have already been mentioned. 
um, you know, the Anita Blake books, um, the Vampire Chronicles, uh, things like that. But I'm also really big on The City and the City by China Mieville, uh, as well as The Tain. Um, I, I love pretty much everything Victor Laval has ever committed to paper. Uh, those are major influences on me, especially Big Machine and uh, Changeling. And um, some of my biggest influences are actually uh, urban fantasy films, like The Wiz uh, made a major impact mm. on me when I was little. And, um, I, you know, I, I just love it so much. And like that kind of anarchic joy is something that I reach for in uh, my own fantasy as much as possible. Right. Cool. Um, it took me a while to even get my head wrapped around urban fantasy at all. In fact, my, uh, my, the Paternus trilogy, I've only written three books, um, is I didn't even call urban fantasy, but now I do. And everybody calls it epic urban fantasy. For me, the, uh, uh, the first, the first thing pops into my head when somebody says, urban fantasy is is dressing files um the wizard demon hunter with a franchise kind of thing um and a lot of urban fantasy kind of stretches that but kind of follows along in that path his he's a private detective sometimes they own a bookstore sometimes they're a hired thief and uh get hired to go out and steal things and then find themselves in all kinds of other trouble, Steve. Um, <laughs> and uh, so, so that one is, is really what I thought. And, and as a definition of urban fantasy, it was always, it takes place today in this world in a city, but it's got magic and maybe monsters and mythological creatures and maybe dragons and, and all these kinds of things. Um, so I remember people having discussions, well, what if it takes place out in the country? Mm -hmm. uh, apparent, that's all still urban fantasy. What if it's more um, romance related, but not really PNR? You know, this is a, a classic. Um, uh, so, and you know, like, I don't know if, uh, you know, the, we've got, you know, Sandman Slim and, um, and then from the mid '60s, you can go back to you know uh, Bulgakov with Master and Margarita. If any of you have read this, um, the devil comes to Moscow, basically. Um, and uh, you know what about military fantasy? You know that that takes place today in this world, but you've got you know special squads going out and having to hunt down you know uh supernatural creatures and such it's it's such a wide a wide broad uh thing so what what all do you th i mean i've heard people call harry potter urban fantasy uh because they say that's today's london or whatever some periods london then there's historical urban fantasy right um so what can we, how, where do we draw the line of what's not urban fantasy anymore? Um, how far can it stretch? Um, if you want to talk about um, things that, you know, like how, uh, what, are, what is the broadest range? How far can it go out and that, that you think that it can? And then, you know, where do your books fall within that? you think the the books that you write where do they fall within within that uh scale um let's start with alex um i think mine fall kind of dead center of urban fantasy um even though my publisher likes to market them as uh contemporary fantasy um but like mm -hmm. they're very much tied to life in the city the sensibility of the city especially such a a strange and idiosyncratic city as New Orleans. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's a good question too. What's the difference these days 
or is there any between urban fantasy and contemporary fantasy? Steve? Uh, to answer the first question, I think it can be stretched as far and wide as you'd like, yeah. depending on the story. Urban fantasy encompasses tons of things. Um, what do you think it has to have? It, what does it have to have? Yeah. It has to have probably magic. I think that's it has to be have magical characters, mythological characters of some description that defy uh, what we can do now. Um, but but take place in today fiction. in the real world. I well see that's the thing because my books are mostly set in modern day, mm -hmm. but they're also set historically. So yeah. um, no gods, only monsters is set in ancient Rome. Um, but it's but it's t uses the same trappings as urban fantasy. There's magic and mythology and monsters and Medusa and Diana and, and Di um, Athena and all the rest of that sort of thing. And and then my my Heliquin books they they've got realms. So things mm -hmm. like Mount Olymp uh, Olympus is a realm and mm -hmm. um, the Arthurian mythologies in there and greek and norse and valhalla and all this kind of stuff they're all in there as well because i just decided that i like mythology so i use all of it um and then mix and match how i feel like it on the day so i think there's no real you can't there's there's, there's nothing to stop you mm -hmm. basically if you want to set i've read so i've read urban fantasy before that was set in a slightly science fiction kind of universe but mm -hmm. in terms but in terms of technology at least there was science fiction sort of tech although it's not it wasn't it didn't feel like science fiction and i think there's there's something to be said for the feel of it um okay that it is magic and monsters and mayhem but it doesn't necessarily have to be set in modern day historically okay. or you know uh futuristically but I think having the magic of monsters and all that kind of thing is is the crux of what urban fantasy is. Um, and I think setting it on Earth, even if it's set in the future or in the past or whatever, is probably or on Earth, uh, Earth, somewhere linked to Earth. <clears throat> I can't say Earth because some of my books weren't set on Earth. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, all these big chunks of them weren't set on Earth. So uh, yeah. I think I think it's whatever you want it to be. I think that's the beauty of urban fantasy and the beauty of quite a lot of um, uh, genres, horror as well. It, mm -hmm. You know, you can you can set it when you like. Really, it's, it's it's less easy to set it when you like when you want to write a science fiction space opera or you want to write an epic fantasy. You can't really set a space opera in ancient Rome. That would be really weird. Um, and good luck to anyone who decides to try that. Um, but otherwise, I think you can just. I think I don't think there's a limit on it. The limit's your imagination and what works for the story. There you go. Awesome. Thanks. JD. Sorry. Little trouble right. in my mic there. Um it's all right. so now I am going to have to write at least a story that is a space opera set in nature. Well, come on. Come on, Steve. <laughs> you knew that was gonna happen. Um, so I, I agree with Steve to a certain extent, but I'd like to refine on it. I don't think it's anything. Um, and I do think that there there is a line between uh, contemporary fantasy and urban fantasy, and that is that um, uh, urban fantasy doesn't have to take place in a city, but it does have to take place in a particular geographical area that functions as a whole, um, and that um, that functions uh, that is like a, a single organism or um, a single ecology or a single machine. Um, the way that a city is a single organism, ecology, or machine. Um, in uh, in the True Blood series, um, the Southern Vampire series, that's um, Bob Tom. Mm -hmm. And and then the broader world of that particular kingdom, and these um, the vampire world is organized into kingdoms, and um, and the, and then there there are, there are smaller like counties with sheriffs and stuff like that. So there's a there's a kind of a, a machine. There's a system um, based on geography. And um, and government within that geography, so that is urban fantasy. Even though it's it's actually on top is a small town, it's in kind of an ex-urban area. Um, you pointed out um, the Mercy Thompson series um, that is that takes place in in the the, the Tri Cities area in Washington. Um, mm -hmm. And um, so, like like I said, it doesn't have to be a city. Um, but it has to function the way the city functions geographically. And, um, and I think 
I think it's important in that way because um, the 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 frizz, the fizzle from urban fantasy comes from the contrast between um, the the rational everyday that we recognize from our own lives and the magic that we introduce into that rational everyday. So we have to see. Uh, the world functioning the way that we expect the world to function in this very orderly, um, this very orderly way with bureaucracy and government and um, and municipalities and so forth um, to get that the the kind of um, fizzle the fizz that that urban fantasy offers. And I'm actually going to contradict myself. I mentioned um, a Nancy Boys and American Gods, the urban fantasy, but I don't think that they are, according to my definition, I think that they're contemporary fantasy because. Um, they are not focused on particular urban areas okay. uh, or particular geographical areas. Um, and they're not also not focused on the way that everyday life functions in terms of, you know, bureaucracy and, um, and government and um, municipality and so forth. Um, and okay. I think my book, uh, Monkey Around, right here, um, is right right in the sweet spot. It's, it's about San Francisco. San Francisco is an actual character um, there's an actual, um, uh, what's the, uh, what's the word? I, I forgot the word. Um, there's an actual spirit of the place in, um, like a, in a, a sentient, a sentient, uh, um, characteristic to the city itself. The city has a spirit that, oh, okay. that has agency yeah. and, and, and communicates right. with the, the characters. Mm -hmm. So it's, so um, it's a, it's, it's a lich city. <laughs> no, um, no, you know that there's an actual trauma. This is my chronic fatigue syndrome brain uh, kind of makes it difficult for me to find words, but um, I'll come up with it again later. No, and it's no. a um, it's a concept that actually pops up in, in a lot of urban fantasy. Mm -hmm. so we'll come mm -hmm. back to. It. Yeah, very, very. Um, yeah, never mind, Chloe. Oh, you've got your uh, mic muted. Sorry about that. Thank you. Um, okay. I'm stuck on this idea um, that JD mentioned of city as an organism or ecology. So I'm just going to be um, part of my brain is now devoted to that. So I'm going to have to reorganize my thoughts. Um, you know, I think um, a couple things. I think one thing um, that at least is true in within this, maybe the subgenre that I write. And then a lot of things we've mentioned is not just that you have this interesting foil between the city and some or the wherever the the locate the set location is the defined location and the kind of mundanity of it um the day-to-day -day stuff plus the supernatural overlay um but in addition to that you also have someone often not always but oftentimes who is either um been forced into that it, to kind of cross those boundaries and then problem solve within those boundaries either it's somebody who didn't have magic who did who who suddenly gets it or didn't know magic existed and suddenly does um and has to exist kind of between those worlds crossing over um someone had mentioned that maybe there's a detective maybe it's somebody who owns a bookstore i think that was mentioned too um in my in chicago and vampires merit is a um English literature, literature PhD student who basically becomes a vampire on page three of the book and has to um, reorient her, herself to her new place in the world um, and then becomes basically a problem solver of magical issues. So there's, there's a sense that um, the adventure for the hero or the journey um, is often getting dragged into supernatural stuff and having to figure out a way for everybody to come through it, or at least most people to come through it safely. Um, and I think that's, you know, a lot of these stories are very character driven. I think sometimes contemporary fantasy can be more um, idea driven or kind of just, um, what do I want to say? Uh, scenic's not the right word, but it's often very setting driven. And urban fantasy obviously has a setting element too, because it's got to be, you know, in that particular ecology. Um, but there is a, there is that problem solving character based kind of sensibility about it. Awesome. Tende? Well, I mean, you've also just expanded my thinking on this. That's why it's always dangerous to go last on, on these things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, well, I'm trying to so, switch it up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah um, because I was thinking of everything you're saying, and, and Chloe, thank you for introducing sort of like the character aspects of it and, and how the character navigates the space between um, 
these kind of like the weird world and 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 the normal world. Um, but I just wanted like a bit of clarification before I really get into it from JD because something sparked in me when you were talking about American gods as not quite being urban fantasy. So just to clarify, are you saying it has to be a specific kind of location that's maybe limited geographically as opposed to a character moving from city to city? Yes, um, I, it, that for me, that, that, that's, what, um, that's what limits uh, urban fantasy is like you can move in and out of the city, but the mm -hmm. focus of the action has to be in a particular city. And I remembered the term that I'd forgotten. It's genius loci or loci, oh, depending oh. on how you find it. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you for that. It, it's very interesting because because even when um, you were speaking about the master and the margarita, when I first read it, I never thought, you know, I never considered it uh, urban fantasy. And I think a function of that also has to be the positioning within the publishing the marketing of, of, of the publishers as well, that that sometimes tends mm -hmm. to shape our perceptions of what it is right. we, we are reading. Right. I mean, um, Alex, you mentioned The City and the City, mm -hmm. uh, which I love. It's been a while since since I read it. And, and, and I was sat there thinking, yeah, but magic's got to be part of this. And I, you know, you had police officers in there and it's fairly bureaucratic. I don't recall anyone doing any magic until I thought, okay, hang on, you've got these, two cities that are cross hatched in the same space. Mm -hmm. So just the act of, of Mievo playing around with the geography um, in a fantastic way, in a fantastical way, because you, you couldn't do it um, any other way. That's what makes it um, urban fantasy. So I guess kind of just trying to, to round up what you guys are saying, it's, it's you have to have the urban aspect and 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 this is almost why I, I tend to struggle a little bit with um books that might be set in the country being defined as such mm -hmm. because I, i've got a sort of more limited view of of sort of like what urban is um and mm -hmm. a city definitely is it a town yeah but the smaller the the, the space becomes i I think it has to be. It has to have something to do with the built environment as well in in the world building. So, if there aren't sort of like man made structures dominating the landscape, and the landscape is more natural, then I I, I tend to struggle with sort of like fantasy in that location uh, mm -hmm. being defined as as urban fantasy. Um, so. For me, that there definitely has to be that aspect of of the built environment it's taking and and the weird shit that that happens there. I, I hope I'm making some sense because yeah. listening to you all has scattered my thoughts everywhere. <laughs> That's what we're here for to scatter everybody's thoughts. Um, so it sounds like it could be a lot of things. JD has the has the 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 most defined it sounds like um def definition definition of it and by that definition a lot of things would be more um contemporary fantasy you know steve your books do jump around in time but yep. they're based they they're based in london I mean, the first one is, and after yeah. that, they're kind of they're based all over the place. They move um, all over the place. Yeah, yeah. I don't, yeah. I don't think I've written any book, yeah, ever that yeah. meets the definition that that definition of urban fantasy because they've yeah, all mine moves set, around quite a bit too. All over so, the place. so by that definition, mine would be much more um, contemporary. Con contemporary fantasy. Mm. Yeah, um, and then we've also got what they call magical realism, right? um which is a a genre um all of gaiman's books are always get put in magical realism categories um and um all that is i think is that it is that in the world in the kind of contemporary world um magic vampires um uh, are normalized they're not something people don't know about. It's something everybody knows about. 
very much like in Charlene Harris's um, uh, series, uh, because everybody knows that everybody now knows they didn't may have not have known, but they now in this in this milieu of of the series, people do know that vampires and things other things do exist, and they just live with it. Um, and uh, that's you know, and in contemporary fantasy or urban fantasy could be, could be magical realism or not, right? It could be something hidden. It could be something not hidden. Um, like a Jim Butcher, it's very much JD's kind of thing because it takes it. Chicago is a big part of it. Is a big part of the whole Dresden file series. Um, uh, but it is not magical realism because the the general population does not know that this stuff is going on. Um, so it's um it's 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 a this is a really fun genre, if we could even really call it that, to talk about. Um what where else do you see it? Where else do you see it going or what kinds of things would you like to see more of in um, related to urban fantasy? And if any of you have something that you'd like to throw up, throw in as a topic, please do. Um, that's one thing I like to do when I moderate panels is I don't want to have to come up or not. <laughs> I don't want to have to come up with all this. No, I don't want to feel like I'm Ent entirely and only directing where the conversation goes. Um, let's start with Tende. Um, where would I like to see it go? I think one of the perks of, of, of doing this is you you start getting arcs and living. They, you made me think of a book that I've read recently that's coming out later this year by A.Y. Chow called Shanghai Immortal. Um, mm -hmm. And in this book, it's sort of set in 20s Shanghai, and, and there's a fusion there of, um, you know, Chinese culture, the French, the British, and the Americans that were all operating within this space at the time. Um, and I think that the great thing about it, you have the conceit of sort of normal Shanghai, but ex who existing within the same space is hell, which is a part of, of, of Shanghai that's that's riffing off that. So you have a lead character who is um, part fox and part, um, so part fox spirit and part vampire. So there's this blending, and I know this blending of 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 cultures has been going on for a, for a while. In in fact, most of the books that that you you mentioned have um, some blending of cultures, but. When I think of that and another one that I'm that I've blurbed, which is Shigidi by um Wale Talabi, that will also come out later on this year, who's a fantastic Nigerian writer, you start finding the drawing in of sort of like we've all seen sort of like a bit of Greek mythology, the Norse thing is pretty big, it's been there, but you get this drawing of other cultures that are kind of They've been there. I mean, for the people that know these cultures well, it's not even a thing. It's it's pretty obvious. Um, but for that's for those of us that have been consuming a lot of mainstream uh, urban fantasy, it's very interesting to start discovering these new cultures and think start thinking, wow, this is this is so dope. I mean, Talabi borrows off the law of the Orishas, which are sort of um, Nigerian deities. Um, but then he mashes that up with deities from Sri Lanka, um, British deities, and 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 it's, it it gets a bit mad to be honest. It's it, it's a heist novel, but the way he does it is so beautiful. So I, I think that kind of blending, but also across across time. Um, the reason I mentioned um, A Y Chao's work is as well. It's it's twenties Shanghai, but it's distinctly urban and so you have that historical element of it um i i think even as we we're going through the definitions earlier there's a sense that within this particular genre whatever it is if we've even managed to define it a, a crucial aspect is this blending and borrowing of stuff from 
different genres and different cultures and, and, and stuff. And I think that's only going to intensify. Yeah. Oh, nice. Steve? Um, I, I really like reading um, urban fantasy is about cultures that I'm not a part of. Mm -hmm. um, I grew up watching quite a lot of Hong Kong cinema. Mm -hmm. Like all of it, if I could get my hands on it, <laughs> and I always like stuff like the Mister Vampire films and things like that. So, urban, any urban fantasy that kind of touches on on um, Asian mythology and, and and just you know, it's just, even mythologies that I I personally didn't know much about until I started writing, like you know, Russian mythology and Slavic mythology and. Indian mythology and stuff like that. Only bits and pieces of them. So I, I enjoy reading books about those because that that a lot of that was new to me. <coughs> I like that. Um, so I'd quite like to see more of it. I'd like to see more um, more diverse authors getting a chance at writing urban fantasy in their, you know, tell their stories. Um, and I think the more diverse it is, the better it is for everybody. So. Um, so that's what I'm kind of hoping that urban fantasy keeps going because obviously uh, it's much more diverse now than it was 10 years ago, five mm -hmm. years ago. So um, hopefully that's a, that's a trend that will keep going. Awesome. Alex. Um, well, I'd, I'd like to see more diversity of course, uh, but I'd like to see more diversity of approaches as well. Um, I tend to like stories that either execute to the nth degree of precision what they're doing or that completely break the mold and combine traditional elements and completely new permutations. Um, so I'm always looking for more of that. Uh, and uh, I guess that's that's basically all I really no, I want to see. Okay. What are, what are, do you have some examples of books that you've read that you'd like to see that kind of thing taken further? I, I would like to see uh, a premise like the city and the city mm -hmm. taken to the absolute um, point beyond. Uh, I like, there's so much there to build on and I can actually, uh, talk about it in terms of some of China Mieville's other work. Uh, like one of my favorite short stories of his is called uh, Report of Certain Events in London. I think it was uh, compiled in his first collection. It was also in a McSweeney's volume, but it takes um, the idea for a, a comic book character like Danny the Street in um, the Grant Morrison Doom Patrol issues Mm -hmm. And it takes that idea to its furthest degree. So you have a street that's not just alive, but that is feral. And like there are other streets like it and they're actually able to mate and be ridden by people who know what they are and what's going on with them. And so, so it takes something that Mieville didn't originate himself and like expands on it and elevates it in this just beautiful way. And I, I, I love that kind of energy in anything I read. Nice. Very cool. Chloe. Oh, you're muted again. Sorry, but I do that. So I don't sniffle. I'm no, just going to leave it off. And you no, actually just okay. listen to me sniffle from that. Extra hour. No, it's fine. Um, one of the things that TL mentioned was the idea of um, kind of stories where the supernatural is just part of the way of life. Not necessarily in a everybody knows about it, but where you cannot draw that line between um, what is quote unquote real and what is quote unquote supernatural. As you noted, I think that, you know, newspaper stories are going to have, here's what happened with the demon yesterday. The demon had this particular update. Um, but I, I think one more, more urban fantasy more more types of urban fantasy uh, more uh a wide more wider ranging mythos than just western mythology i want to see but i really love this idea of um the mythology that's just so ingrained to the human experience that 
it's not even thought of as a separate thing. Um, and I have, I have my list of books that I read last year and one of them, and I will apologize in advance for the author's name. And I don't know if I'm going to say it correctly, but it's Vagabonds by Elagosa Osunde, which was fantastic. And it is such a story of just the integration of the supernatural so that it's not even the supernatural. It's just, it, it just is, it's just the world. And when you do that well, it is transportative um, and it's totally engrossing. And I just absolutely adore that approach. It's such a unique approach. Um, and I, I can't think of a lot of books that do it, um, that kind of take that focus, at least in an urban fantasy, because there has been such a focus on, like I mentioned, the character who has to fight the supernatural problems and then maybe becomes the supernatural hero, um, him or herself. Um, so that idea of the integrated magic, I, I just, it blew my mind and it was really, really wonderful. And also more urban fantasy because the market has been very difficult in the last few years. So that would be my other wish for the future would just that there would be more of it. Yeah. Claire. Um, so instead of repeating what everybody said, which I totally agree with, um, and, and, what Alex mentioned, that, that story by China Mabel is one of my favorites, the Feral Street story. So highly recommend reading that. Um, so yeah, uh, diversity of, um, of mythologies and diversity of approaches. Um, but I, I did want to mention that um, what Chloe and I have written um, is, I think, a subgenre of urban fantasy, which is, you know, the paranormal detective story. Mm -hmm. um, there are, you know, there are detectives, there are enforcers, there are people who are hired to, to cross over the, across the border, the borderlands and, um, and do kind of organizational things. Um, and um, that particular subgenre, it has sort of did for a couple of uh, decades take over urban fantasy, the mm -hmm. definition of the term urban fantasy, even though there was a lot of other kinds of urban fantasy happening in and around it. And then, um, and then the market got glutted. And um, since 2015, everybody's been saying urban fantasy is dead because this this type of paranormal detective subgenre has been dead. And um, and what uh, another uh, Asian American urban fantasy writer, um, Sarah Kuhn, said um, when her first book came out, um, also wonderful, also taking place in San Francisco, called a super or heroin complex, um, is. A, she, you know, she just, it was kind of a throwaway line, but she was like, you know, they declare urban fantasy dead as soon as the diverse people could start telling our stories. In it. And it's like, well, you know, what about us? This has been about vampires and werewolves for yeah. 20 years. And then all of a sudden we start bringing in different mythologies and everybody declares urban fantasy dead. So I would like to see, um, because urban fantasy is very much alive and, and is more diverse than ever right now. And there's so much amazing diverse urban fantasy coming out, including paranormal detectives, like my own, Maya McQueen, um, and, um, and, but also including completely different approaches like Alex's um, uh, The Ballad of Perilous Graves, which mm -hmm. is amazing and delightful and everybody should run out and buy it. Um, I'd, like, I'd like for readers, what I'd like to see is on the other side, I'd like for readers to make room on their reading lists and in their heads again for urban fantasy because I, it might be because the attention was taken off for urban fantasy, but it has completely blossomed behind the scenes, a little bit behind the scenes, ever since it was declared dead seven or eight years ago. Nice. Um, I just want to say, for, for, for those of you listening, um, we are going to take questions. So you, if you have specific questions for any of us or for the panel uh, as a whole, please uh, go ahead and start throwing those into the uh, into the comments section and uh, we'll get to the as many of those as we can when we get to the question portion of the panel. Um, so now I'd like to just ask, um, what are the kinds of things that you would like to ask the rest of the panel to talk about? Um, just I'm not going to call on people just start start talking and see what do you what would you guys like what kind of things would you guys like to get into um for for some of the rest of our conversation i i don't know that this is specific to urban fantasy but i love to hear about process um you know how you uh, when you come up with an idea where you get it how do you work that out do you outline first are you a, a, a we say at least in the romance community a pantser or a plaster 
Um, do you do the planning beforehand? Are you, do you dive into books? I love partly as the tax deduction that we discussed earlier. I love um, being able to engross myself in whatever kind of magic it is. So I want to find the books. I want to buy them or get them from the library and really dive in, kind of do a deep dive into whatever the magical thing is that I'm playing with at the time. Um, how does everybody else, how do you guys approach when you're writing about, when you're writing books that, that integrate magic and the mundane human experience, how do you, how do you write that? What's your process? Well, one thing for anybody that could, who wants to answer that, uh, that could be a general, you're right. That could be a general question for any yeah. kind of writing, yeah, yeah. But, but, but we could narrow it down a little bit to urban fantasy, because if we're writing about new Orleans, right. Or Edinburgh or London. Um, uh, and you know, uh, my, my books start out in Toledo, um, and they move to different, different locations around the world. Um, and to, well, and some other worlds and some different other weird shit, but, um, <laughs> there's, there's a certain it, writing comp contemporary fantasy and certain, and, and urban fantasy, there's a certain, um, type of research or, or, um, knowledge of the world you, you, you have to put in that's different from if you're just completely making up some, you know, pseudo medieval kingdom right um so maybe we could talk about process and research um when it comes to writing about real world locations and things like that and how how do you approach that alex um uh, good question i mean that that was sort of a long time coming for me in my approach uh because I was writing about a city that uh, I was not born and raised in. Uh, mm -hmm. I moved here when I was like 26 or 27. And, you know, there is a lot of gentrification going on, especially in the wake of Hurricane Katrina. And uh, there's a lot of marginalization of people who are born and raised here. So I knew that one thing I didn't want to do was take up space not meant for me and like try to present some sort of definitive version of New Orleans and its culture and its people that isn't mine to comment on. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was one of the reasons why I created this sort of unit New Orleans um, that I could shape as I see fit and use that to make my statements uh, without acting like they're the end all be all of what can be said about the city. Um, I'm also approaching the book that I'm working on now with that same sensibility, and I hope I get it right. <laughs> I'm sure people will tell me one way or the other. <laughs> that okay. is a unique thread of writing urban fantasy, contemporary urban fantasy set in yeah. an existing city is you really hope you get it right. Yeah, oh. yeah. Yeah, either that or be so general that still no one can can say yeah. you're wrong because you're so general. <laughs> I'd like I, honest look on the map and name a name a few street names and you're all good, right? Honestly, I don't know how to make that work. I also like I, I'm not really good at setting things in places that I'm not intimately acquainted with. Mm -hmm. Like I mm -hmm. need to I need to know what it feels like to have the air of that place on my skin. Uh, to be immersed in its culture and, and the minds of the people that live there. Uh, so, you know, when I, when I look at some of the work that influenced me most, like the work of Alan Moore, who wrote these stories set in the United States that um, worked well without his ever having been over here or explored these places. And, you know, I kind of wish I could do that myself, but yeah, I just don't think so. And it's a very different world now, having the internet. Imagine doing the same things that we do on a daily basis with a typewriter and no ability, and having to get on a ship True. to go to travel anywhere, right? Steve? Uh, well, to answer Chloe's question, I, I'm, I, I answer mostly eight yeah. hours ago along. Um, I know how the book ends. And I, I know how the book ends. I know the main plot points I want. I do all the world building beforehand, and then I just crack on. That's crazy. I, I have such such admiration for people who can do that. I just, yeah. I absolutely cannot. At the end of every day, um, 
because I know when I start the chapter, I know how it'll end. I don't know how the chapter's going to end before I start it. Um, but at the end of every day, I read back what I did the day before and make any changes I need to, and then just go on from there. Um, so, yeah, that's how I've done it. I've, I've tried to do it plotting, and it fails miserably. <laughs> My brain goes, no, nope, we're doing this, and then we go and do this. Yeah. So uh, I, I've decided not to fight with myself and just let it happen. Whatever um, works. Yeah, well, it works, so I'm happy. Mm -hmm. um, as for the the places, uh, most of my books, I've never been to the places I've set them. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I've never been to Brooklyn, I've, I've, and I've set two books there. Mm -hmm. And no one's ever said to me, this doesn't feel like Brooklyn. I've had mm -hmm. people from Brooklyn who have said, you've been to Brooklyn? I have not. I have Google mm -hmm. Earth, and I have mm -hmm. friends who live in Brooklyn. Mm-hmm. And that's so that, kind of how it's done. That's where you get, it. yeah. You get you talk to friends who live there. Yeah. And uh and and look at maps and such. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the ninety percent of the time, if I'm gonna blow up a big part of some um, some country or town or whatever, I make the town up. I just I just give it yeah. a name of a place mm -hmm. that's not real. Mm -hmm. Um so so for the last raven, um there's a town between Rochester and uh syracuse that i made up called hamble mm -hmm. um which is where i live nearly well where i always grew up anyway close to where i grew up so um yeah i just basically take the places in england that i've lived in or live near and put them in america because mm -hmm. that's what they did when they got to america so it doesn't seem all that weird <laughs> so yeah that's how i do it <laughs> a lie basically is what i'm saying uh-huh uh-huh jd so um for chloe's question um i uh started out as a pantser and alex and i are actually um clarion west cohorts from 2003 um and um and I, you could you could feel the house that we were living in like start to catch fire every night from all of the insane pantsing that was going on in that house. <laughs> there was a lot of pantsing, and um, and I and I did that, and it's a very very um, labor intensive and energy intensive process. Mm -hmm. um, and then in 2014 or 20, 2010, right when I my first book, which was a collection of short stories that I pantsed, came out, um, I got sick with chronic fatigue syndrome, and um, my brain stopped working the same way. My brain stopped working as well. And um, I could not, I did not have the energy to pants anymore. So I didn't write for about three years. And then I decided, all right, you know, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to have to figure out a different way to do it. So I started outlining and writing from outline. And um, now I am a complete plotter. I, I plot um, everything out scene by scene like a movie. I, I learned how to plot from taking this writing for stage and screen class at college. And so I do it that way. And um, and people tell me that my, my book is very cinematic as a result. There's a reason for that. But um, in any case, so that's that's Chloe's question. Um, as to Dirk's question, um, I, I, I'm totally with Alex. I've tried writing stories that um, happen in cities that I've never been to, and they're just completely flat. Um, I require the kind of specificity that you need from walking the streets every day. Um, and I wrote Monkey Around about um, San Francisco. It, 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 it's not just that. I wrote Monkey Around about activists in San Francisco, about Asian American social justice activists in San Francisco, because that's what I am. And that's the, the layer of San Francisco that I live in. Mm -hmm. And um, and. The, the two things are completely intertwined. The city, the cities actually that were in an area of conurbation that um, that is very much one one place together with a bunch of separate cities that you know you move very freely among, um, and those are very bound up in you know activists are are some of the people who you know activists first responders you know are, are some of the people who know. Um, the city on the ground best because you have to, you know, every city is different when you get down to the nitty gritty of serving the people who live there. 
if you're serving the people who live there in very particular ways, um, you have to know every community, every um, all, all of the leaders, all of the individuals, the, um, the feel of the neighborhoods, the, the needs of the neighborhoods, and so on and so forth. Um, so that feeds, right? this, this is why I wrote Urban Fantasy because um, I live in the, the I live in the layer of the city um, that understands the city that functions as an organism or a machine, as I said at, at the beginning. Um, and I, I live in a city that functions as an organism or as a machine. If that makes any sense. Sure. Yeah. Um, ten day. Wow. Well, um, for me, um, it's. It's like Mike Tyson said, everyone's got a plan until they, they get punched in the mouth. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I consider myself a plotter. I, I, I work out what I want to do, you know, and, mm -hmm. and I, I write copious amounts of notes and I have this idea um, that's, you know, and, and, and for everyone, your idea is perfect until you start typing away, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's how I start. But then start, stuff starts happening, and uh, I've, I've described the process of, of writing the Edwin Renite series for me as a call and response between me and the city, because I, I like going to locations, because I'm always looking for something quirky, something a little bit different that you might not see on mm -hmm. Google Earth or Street View. There's always going to be something. It might be a piece of graffiti that you can work in there or something very, very specific about the texture of a particular building or something. Um, so, for example, I, I have the Society of Magicians, and I knew what my magical system should be. Um, but my main character as a ghost talker speaks with ghosts, and there's a library of the dead. The, the entrance for it, I, I went through all these different graveyards in Edinburgh uh, until I got to Old Carlton Burial uh, Ground. And I saw this beautiful round mausoleum, right? And I'm like, oh, this is great. That is my entrance guy. <laughs> Who was buried there? David Hume, the philosopher. So now I'm having to think about um, Hume's philosophy, skepticism, empiricism. And so my society of magicians, I had to change the name to the Society of Skeptical Inquirers to give a nod to Hume mm. to make it obvious. Uh, who was Hume's best friend? Adam Smith, economist, philosopher. Again, it's a very commercial kind of magic. So things start moving in a different direction from where you originally intended. And mm -hmm. I think at, at moments like that, you sort of have to go with it. Um, I mean, for book two, I was looking for a nice building in which to, to, set, um, to set the headquarters of, of sort of like this magical society that I have in there. And there's this building that I love in the new town, which is called, um, it's called Dundas House and it's on St. Andrews Square and it's the headquarters for the Royal Bank of Scotland. Now I've got this building that I like, but I have to go deep into banking history. Why are they there in this old <laughs> bank building? And so I went down the rabbit hole, kind of like researching the history of the Royal Bank of Scotland and it turns out that history is tied into empire, slavery, colonialism. I mean, it's the whole history of modern Scotland after, you know, from the time Scotland joins the union with England in 1707 onwards. So this history starts pouring forth from the buildings. Now, these are spaces that I've been past. I moved to Edinburgh in 2005 as a student. So nearly 20 years now, not quite. Um, but these are spaces that I go through every day. But once I start writing about them, you know, I start finding out all this history and all these wonderful things. And, and some of the stuff can be like really weird because I wanted an archive to use an archive. Like, so I had to find out where the Royal Bank's archive was. And there's this industrial park outside of the city. Now, when you think of an archive, right, you think of, you know, people in, you know, all people in Tweed jackets and stuff like that all the historical buildings but it turns out when i got there that the archives for the bank were set in an industrial unit and the archivists they love it because this unit you know it's they can work in all the gear that they need to preserve their documents so 
temperature control, um, fire suppressing systems that you can't really do in all historical buildings. So you start getting these random bits that you work into the story, but you kind of have to be there and 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 speak with people and and kind of just ask these questions. So I, I'm I'm always looking for the thing that you won't necessarily find on on Google. If you Google it, it, it might not be on page one. You know, you, you might really have to dig to find this detail. And when you work in there, when you work that stuff in there, I think, A, for me, it, it gives me quite a lot of um, satisfaction. But every so often, there'll be a reader who says to you, I, I didn't know that about this place, particularly when it's someone from the city who's who's reading it. So I'm, I'm, I'm always looking for that that thing that someone who's perhaps lived in the place their whole lives hasn't encountered before. Does that make any sense at all? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Chloe, I know you um, brought up the question, but yeah. So I am a plotter um by necessity because I have a day job. And so in order to get books written on time, I need to kind of know what I'm doing so that when I sit down, I can just go. Um Although I'm now, I, I have no books. I have a book coming out in November, but no books otherwise under contract right now. So I'm kind of working on my next um, couple of ideas. And those I'm taking a much more, let me just put paper to pen and see where it goes, which is so different from what I have done for my entire career, except for my very first book. So that's been, it's an interesting and it's been um, a joy, but it is a very different experience than having an outline, which I usually do. Each of my books usually takes place over about a week. So my outline, um, I know where it's going to start, I know where it's going to end, and then I, I uh, kind of set out the big events that are going to happen in each of the subplots over the course of the seven days. So I have basically on day seven, so-and-so goes here, they learn this, they learn that, and then I can write and add in the banter and the action um, as I go along. Um, I actually, so I don't, most, let's see, how many almost 20 of my books are set in Chicago. Um, the others are set in um, kind of Napoleonic War era London and then New Orleans. And I, one of the reasons I set them in Chicago is because it was in within driving distance of where I live. Um, so what I did when I first started writing, in addition to Google Street View, which is just a miracle if you need to double check something, is I would go to Chicago and try to do scouting locations, which basically means I drive around one particular neighborhood and try to get a feel for it. Is it residential? Is it commercial? Um, you know, what's, who lives here? Is it artists? Is it people who've lived in Chicago forever? Is it tourists who are coming here? Um, you know, what do they eat in this particular neighborhood? Um, and it was really by kind of understanding the neighborhood and looking, as TL mentioned, for those little Chicago specific details um, that I kind of was able to build the Chicago lane world. But I, it's really hard to find that stuff on Google Street View. Or on Google. I mean, as much research as you know as you can do. And I have, there's an entire shelf up there. The first two shelves on the far left are all Chicago books. Um, so I kind of read my way through it. But you, you, it is hard to replicate being on the ground and looking for those little details of who is passing you as you walk down the street. You know, what kind of cars are going by? What is the air smell like? Does it smell like hot dogs? Does it smell like, you know, a gas station over here? Does it smell like a tourist popcorn stand? Um, so to the extent that I can, I like to be on the ground. Um, that's true for New Orleans as well, which is just so many layers of history and knowledge and architecture and food. Um, I mean, and also I like to go for the food, to just be honest, Chicago and New Orleans have fantastic food to offer. So that is a big incentive to go and be on the ground when I can. And while you're out there, Chloe, sorry if I can jump in quickly. Have you ever experienced this thing that happens where you work in a, a particular location and then they close it down or they knock the building down? Yep, yep, that's very frustrating. So I have a scene in my in the book that is being edited right now where it's just it's an empty lot that didn't used to be, but it is now. But then maybe it you know it came down for some supernatural reason. I do, um, and I can't remember who noted that if you're going to blow up a building, it might have been Steve. If there's something you're going to blow up, maybe invent that one. Because yeah. then, you know, if, if there's something I'm not sure of, I tend to make it up for for reasons like that because you never know what could happen down the road. Cool. I um, I uh, have always been a plotter, but then I'll stop and change things 
as as needs be because sometimes like steve said so, no mm -hmm. stories doesn't need and often for me it's the characters tell me yeah we're not doing that we wouldn't do that so they mm -hmm. have to do something else mm -hmm. um so i'll have to replot i always need to know where things are going the the book i'm writing right now is not contemporary or urban fantasy and i did start i just started in on it with the basic idea and wrote the first 60,000 words just flew and then it hit a wall hard. So I had to stop and, and uh, do, do some serious figuring out of where I wanted it to go and how. Um, and I pretty much stuck to that since once I did that. As far as um, writing areas, it sounds like a lot of us write about areas that we know because we're close, you know. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, Toledo is is fairly easy um i've been to a few places i spent two months in sri lanka so there is one location um that take that is near sri, La sri lanka it's an, an invisible magic island but i base it on the flora and fauna and weather and, and such of uh, of sri lanka and for places like uh the the toros mountains and foothills and rural areas of Turkey, uh, east in Eastern Turkey, where I never have been and probably won't go, and certainly didn't have time to go while I was writing, and other locations. One thing I found really, really helpful uh, for people uh, who might be new and, and wanting to figure out how to do that is um, I go to tourist sites, um, and uh, and not necessarily what the tour what the tour guides and the touring company talks about. But very often there's a whole section where it's videos and, pe and people who have gone on those tours um, talk about what they saw, you know, when they hiked these trails and went to these villages or, or went to these things and what, what interested them. Um, so I did that. And then same thing, same thing for when I had to place a, uh, 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 a bunch of scenes in uh, a city in, in uh, Norway. Um, I, I just looked at what people said when they traveled there and I kind of used the same perspective and POV that I have when I go to places and the things that I find interesting. Um, and then just sprinkle it in. I, I don't want to like describe everything exactly the way it is, but sprinkle, sprinkle it in. Um, as far as architecture or what you see in the field or along the road or, or things like that. Um, I found those kinds of things to be, to be super helpful. Um, I, um, I'm look, I've been looking through the uh, comments and we don't have a lot of questions uh, so far, but uh, one of them is my mother has asked, what does Chloe have on the table behind her? <laughs> so i i'm not sure if you're pointing at the books or this this is a giant i'm a quilter oh, that, that this thing. was by the hobby that i took up during covid yeah so this is a giant puff quilt Neat. which is next to another rainbow quilt which you can see over here oh okay that's why she was interested and that yep. can tell you i guarantee you that's what she was interested in. <laughs> yes my mother is watching so <laughs> you guys want to harass me now's the time to do it <laughs> um, other than that we don't have a lot of questions um, except for fan Attic says if you have questions now is the time to ask them um, so what else would you guys like to talk about um, regarding the evolving landscape of urban fantasy um, and uh, the way that the way that it defines a genre or doesn't um, or maybe even how books are shelves. Uh, Kit Kitvaria, who I am assuming is Jules uh, Kitvaria, um, is says that, said that um, uh, while contemporary fantasy is the more fitting term for a lot of books, almost none of my customers at the bookshop even know the term. Mm -hmm. um, urban fantasy seems to be more widely known and used by readers. Um, and you know, you go, if you go and look up urban fantasy in, on, uh, Amazon, right, which their categories are a mess, you're going to find everything from harem to lit RPG and progression fantasy to, to, you know, Jim Butcher and Neil Gaiman 
Um, it's just a wide ring, but you won't see things like a lot of the books that we've talked about, like Anne Rice or um, even Neil Gaiman uh, to a certain extent. Um, and there are so many, so many great books that we haven't even brought up, like Mike Carey's Felix Castor series, and and, uh, and just there are and Simon Green of uh, Nightside, is that what it's called? Mm -hmm. um, such fun stuff, and uh, which is you know, and you know, some of them are almost like a portal fantasy because you know it takes place in London, but you've got to go under London to find the real magic stuff going mm -hmm. on, and sometimes it leaks out above. But uh, it's uh, so. What other kinds of things uh, are you guys interested in? Let me see if we've gotten any. Um, yeah, here's a question. This is from me here at Fantasy Book Critic. Uh, he says, will any of you write a UF set in Asia or other non-North American set landscapes? And you guys just jump in. It's a free uh, I will and I have. In fact, uh, in the anthology that just came out in November, uh, Africa Risen, I have a sort of superheroic fantasy story set in Tunis, Tunisia. Um, which is somewhere I lived all through high school. Oh. And uh, I think it's a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, I would love to, um, but I would have to, uh, because I, I can't, I discovered I can't write a place that I don't know very well. Uh, I would either have to write something that, that takes place in 70s Hong Kong, or, <laughs> uh, or I would have to... Please, God, someone give me a, um, you know, someone invite me to uh, to an Asian country to um, to be a writer in residence there for a certain period of time, so that I can, can get to know. Um, I, I would love to go. Actually, I would love to go back to Hong Kong and see what it's like now. I haven't been in thirty years. Um, Maybe I should do that. Maybe I should just go to Hong Kong for a while and yeah. uh, invite something there. But, but for me, you know, I would, I would really. The reason that I limit myself to, um, to North American cities is because that's what I know. Mm -hmm. I write what I know. Yeah. Uh, most of my books aren't set in North America. They're set in <laughs> England, England, or uh, some in Scotland, and there's some in Northeastern Europe, and some in just Germany, France, um, Egypt. Um, yeah, that that none of my books are set in one place. They're all over the place, and um, which which might be why it's more contemporary fiction, fantasy than the known fantasy, because the the city isn't really a part of the story. It's the characters that are a part of the story. The the city is just the place the story is taking part in. Cool. I don't have right. any planned at this point. I'll write more Paternus books one day that do take place all over the place and incorporate myths and locations from all over the world but um uh jessica carter asks you all talked about the importance of place how does transportation and the ways people move through a city cars versus public transportation versus walking etc and i would add magic <laughs> factor into your plots i uh, um, Oh, sorry. Sorry. Uh, uh, just quick. Well, I, I have a, a in in the Heliquin book in the Heliquin books. I'll start again. Um, I have a realm uh, called Avalon, and in it, there's a magically magically powered trams that run the whole city. Mm -hmm. um, and I worked with trains for over a decade before I left to write full time. Um, so I've blown up quite a lot of trains since then. In my books so i use magical trains quite a lot because i quite like destroying them <laughs> it, it, it's, it's cathartic basically uh so that's kind of so I, I i like to think about transport especially if it's uh a non-earth city um how they're going to get around and and uh, and the like so yeah trains and trams are my particular favorite mode of transport mm -hmm. Alex, you had something. 
Well, you know, I spent a lot of time being church mouse poor over the years. So I used a lot of public transportation here in New Orleans. And so I have two major uh, modes of public transport in the Ballad of Perilous Graves. One is the uh, floating sky trolleys that are everywhere in the city. And another one is the dead taxi, which is the only way to get to the dead side of town. Um, and I, I mean, I just, I spent so much time with both of those and I love them so much. Uh, they make me really happy. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, for me, I, I've, uh, I've always been a walker and, um, and walkers have to use public transportation a lot. Um, and the, the Bay area is very, very connected. Um, in, in, if you, if, you know, if you're somebody who needs to, um, Get around to a lot of different places in a city you need the public transportation because um even if you have a car there's never any parking so um so i was able to parlay that into um into an urban fantasy in which i have a character who's very very highly super powered and can fly mm -hmm. but she does get tired after a while a lot of shit's going on you know she's a excuse my language um she's a, a She's an activist, she's a barista, and she's um, she's investigating a murder mystery. So, you know, she has very, very long days. At the end of some days, she's too tired to fly. So she ends up taking BART or bumming a ride off of somebody. So there's um, there's a lot of integration of um, with various characters of, um, you know, some characters who are um, water creatures who swim, but then they have to take Muni to work. Mm -hmm. um, or, um, you know, a character who flies to work, flies across the bay to work, but is too tired to fly home. So she has to take part home. Um, and, and it, you know, it's, it's a, it's a kind of a magical mirror to the way that people actually function in a city like this, where, um, you might walk somewhere And San Francisco is very walkable. You might walk somewhere. Um, and then it's late at night and you don't want to walk home. So you, you know, um, you take a uh, ride share or you take the bus or what have you. Um, so yeah, there's a there's a lot of mix and match transportation in my city. Mm -hmm. Chloe or Tandy, anything on that one? Um, so for me, I think the transportation elements, especially in the Chicago books, are not um, they're not magical in any respect. But it you know Chicago is a very big city. It is walkable in certain neighborhoods. Um, with your if you're in the neighborhood but it is a big city and it's hard to cross, you know, kind of just on foot. Um, but that, you know, it comes up most often if there's a tra traffic snarl and whether you're on a bus or you're in a car, it can be very difficult to get across town to that um, magical emergency when you're sitting in traffic on the Dan Ryan and it's been backed up for an hour. So I would say it t in Chicago, at least it's more of a hindrance um, to solving magical problems than a magical element in itself. And one of the things I try to do in the Library of the Dead is to use geography and landscape as a way of playing around with time. So you have um, horse-drawn carts moving next to electric vehicles um, and are sort of resurrected bits of Edinburgh that don't exist anymore. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit weird and, and, and disorienting for, for some readers, or, or at least so, so I've been told. Um, but I did that also because where I'm from in Zimbabwe, you have, say, Harare, which is a very modern city, you know, but you go outside of it just 20 minutes away and there's people that are still living in sort of traditional huts that are patched. So I kind of use these elements as a way to say, well, the story is slightly set into the future, in the future, but it draws on, on this history. So by doing that with the transportation um, that the people use within the story, I found that as an interesting way of kind of pointing to what I'm doing with time, as opposed to the normal thing where you just play with chronological leaps. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, transportation in any sort of fantasy is, is, is something that you really have to think about because you know, even in 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 uh, a medieval European based fantasy like um, uh, uh, Game of Thrones, some people can ride dragons. You know, the rest of them have to haul their asses around on their feet or horses, right, all the time. And things, distances take a certain time to cover. 
Um, of course, in the TV show, when things when dragons start to travel a lot faster than they ever could before, um, mm -hmm. things get a little weird. Um, and you have to kind of follow those rules. Um, so uh, I just decided that only under very specific certain circumstances and from certain locations could anybody ever teleport. And um, very few can fly. Um, some have the power to stretch space um, and, and move, but most of them just, even the even super ancient and powerful beings, one, these, these two characters in, in my book too get stuck in one location um, and they could physically run from Toledo to New York City if they needed to and just never stop and get there. But that's not very practical. So they have to walk up. The, they end up walking up the street and just buying an old van that somebody has for sale out in front of their yard, uh, out in their yard um, and driving that <laughs> to Detroit and then to, then to New York. Um, whereas other other characters under certain circumstances can, you know, travel from, um, uh, from, uh, 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 from Valhalla <laughs> or, uh, Yggdrasil will just, you know, take them over on Bifrost, um, anywhere they want to go and whatever world as well. So it's, uh, but your your characters do need to move from here to there so you have to think about how long is that going to take and how much of that am i going to take up and and so transportation is is a, a really interesting part of of fantasy in particular um for urban fantasy unless we're using magic stuff we can just use what we know right like like a lot of you folks have said um here's uh here's a question uh, yes, I'll just answer me here. Yes, uh, there will be some more Varuna Mitra um, in in some of the later Paternus books. So play a large part in that. But Give Coffee Q asks, can you talk about the magic or mythologies you like to use and why it's important part of this genre? Um, I, I like to use all of them in reading. <laughs> And I don't like to choose. Or, or so, so my Heliquin, Avalon, and Rebellion Chronicles, because they're one one series, has um, uh, English, Irish, Norse, Greek, Greek, Greek. Roman, Greek. Egyptian, mm -hmm. and a couple of others. I can't think of off the top of my head. Um, uh, because I, I wanted to. Mm -hmm. So uh, um, the whole point of the world is that all mythology is real and all the mythology mythological characters were real mm -hmm. so i got to write a book where you know merlin is in the same book as aries mm -hmm. so um that was pretty cool um <laughs> and i think mag magic is an integral part of urban fantasy i think um and and contemporary fantasy as well even if it's not flashy magic even if it's just you know sleight of hand magic which is kind of a little bit more like um, never uh, 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 Neil Gaiman's stuff is more less flashy magic and more sleight of hand magic, um, emotion magic and things like that. Uh, it's still magic, and so I think it's an important part of the story. Um, otherwise, you've just got a thriller mm. <laughs> with, with, with people walking about and solving crimes and whatever. Or an adventure, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You've got an adventure book. Um, mm -hmm. As soon as you put magic in it becomes something else. Mm -hmm. um, I've, I've also used a lot of different types of mythology in Monkey Around. Um, because I, I work in the Asian American social justice continuum, I interact with Asian Americans of a bunch of different um, backgrounds and um, ethnicities. And um, I, we also collaborate a lot with other um, social justice communities, especially the Latinx community. Um, so uh, I made sure to include uh, in in my in my novel, the um, in my world, the um, the supernats uh, are living as humans and they're living human lives. So there are a lot of supernats in the activist community as well. And um, so I made sure that that all of the people that I tend to interact with in my daily life 
have their mythologies represented in supernatural creatures. And I didn't try to force them all into one particular type of system of magic. Um, there's, there is like one general system of magic in, in my world and there's ambient magic and then there's inherent magic. But then beyond that, you know, the inherent magic follows the rules of the particular mythology that they come from. So there's all different kinds of bizarre creatures who have all different kinds of bizarre um, abilities and I just let them be that way. And I think that's important um, to um, my take on the genre because my take on the genre is that um, the city, you know, this particular area of conservation is a place where people flow to from all over the world. This is a port of entry, it's a port and people flow in and out um, and cultures flow in and out and languages um, and cultural mores and uses flow in and out. And so the mythologies flow in and out as well. And um, sometimes they clash and sometimes they meld and sometimes they just live um, alongside each other. And that's important. It's important to reflect the, the actual nature of the city and the magic of the city. Cool. Anybody else? Uh, sure. Um, I like to primarily use West African and uh, African American folklore, um, but there are a lot of other tangential bits and dashes that I throw in as well. Um, so I, I kind of like to draw on the cultural landscape of New Orleans. And so there's a large Vietnamese population. There is a uh, you know, a, a, a decent number of immigrant families here. And I, I never want to exclude any culture or tradition that has taken part in the history and life of New Orleans uh, when I'm writing here. So uh, the thing that I like to do is always be extremely careful with people's mythology, traditions, and folklore, and uh, treat them as I would, you know, a contemporary religion, um, and make sure that I'm not trying to be authoritative in any way. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's what I like to do. Nice. Um, we only have a few minutes, but... Um, uh... We have a question here from Kit Baria. It says, can you re I think this is a good way to end up. Can you recommend some more diverse books? Um, as you said, there are a lot a lot more of them out now. What um, more diverse um, uh, books that you know of and have read and liked that would you guys like to re recommend? Uh, somebody who is not often on the radar of... <laughs> Uh, fantasy and SF fans is Lady Hubbard. Uh, she she does write literary fiction, especially at short length, and uh, she has a short story collection, uh, her most recent book called uh, The Last Suspicious Holdout. But uh, she also wrote two fantasy novels, The Talented Ribkins, about a, a family of Black uh, superpowered individuals, and a sort of prequel of sorts called The Rib King. And all of her books are fantastic. She studied under Rick Morrison, and uh, she's a truly lovely person as well. Nice. Um, I would um, strongly recommend, in urban fantasy, um, there is uh, the beginning of a series, which I don't think is going to be continued, by Rebecca Roanhorse called the Sixth World Series, mm -hmm. which takes place in the near future on um, the Navajo Nation or the Diné Nation. Um, and that one's fantastic. Um, there is a, a, a recently completed trilogy called um, The Greenbone Saga by Fonda Lee, which everyone agrees is urban fantasy, even though it takes place in a secondary world. Um, absolutely wonderful. Um, and um, there, are, um, there are series by uh, Zen Cho, by... Um, let me see who else. Oh, I, I mentioned earlier Sarah Kuhn. Um, and oh, uh, P. Jelly Clark. Jelly is D J E L I. P. Jelly Clark um, has, um, I think, uh, is it two novels out now? 
or, or is it two? I, I can't remember the, the number because I haven't read the, the the second one yet. But there's there's like a there's a, a, a either two um, novellas and a novel or. I think it's two novellas and a novel, but that was I was going to recommend those and Rebecca Rowan Horses too. Those are both fantastic series. Yeah. Three three novellas. Three novellas. Three novellas. Okay. Yeah. And can I also quickly recommend a yeah. fantastic yeah. author? His name is C. T. Rizzi. Mm -hmm. um, the first book in the series is called Scarlet Odyssey. It is a fantastic, fantastic work of fiction. It's it's one of those that you read and you like. Why isn't everyone reading this? Because mm -hmm. it's so awesome. Um, that's one I would, I would hope people buy. Scarlet Odyssey. Okay. Mm -hmm. Me here recommends Haunting of Tram Car 13. Yeah, that's one of the Peter Jelly Clark novellas. Yeah. And that is fan. They are so good. And yeah. it, it tends to, they fall into... Um, the the subgenre of urban fantasy that um, Jay mentioned earlier it's it's very much in that classic um, solving magical problems arena but in a completely um, fantastic uh, and new world they're they're just fantastic they're really good awesome and um, if, if and if nobody has read this this now this is this right here is um, is definitely in the contemporary fantasy realm um, rather than urban fantasy but the um, the new series by Danielle Clayton called The Marvelers mm -hmm. is, um, we talked about Harry Potter earlier, and um, this one is kind of like the diverse, non-transphobic Harry Potter, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> which which starts in New Orleans and then goes up into the clouds literally, and is takes place mostly in the clouds, but touches down in New Orleans. Um, a couple of times, and um, and it is it's a it's a children um, at a at a wizarding school story basically, but the but it's just her imagination is prodigious, and it's it's just full of delightful details and so forth. The Marvelers. Nice. Anything else? I, I I'd like to recommend Chasing Embers by James Bennett. It's mm -hmm. about um, uh, it's it's the first book in the um, the Ben Garson series. It's about dragons in in, but they look human, um, and they're great. And and uh, yeah, I I, I, um, I really enjoyed them. So they deserve to be much bigger than they are. No, yeah. that's that's always the case. It seems. Yeah, to yeah, it really is. Oh, I, I'm looking forward to a day when we don't have to say that about yes. more more diverse stories right <laughs> That's, oh uh, but... i'm sorry I, I would also recommend no gods no monsters by cadwell turnbull it's the okay. first in a trilogy and it's fantastic okay cool all right well that's uh 93 minutes i think we're uh i think we're about done thank you everybody this has been an education thank you. <laughs> for thank, me thank you. Thank you. Thank you very um, much. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Um, thank you. Hopefully, I think somebody's probably standing by somewhere to uh, to shut us down. So, uh, have a great day, and I hope I hope you enjoyed the panel. Thanks. Thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs>